to create a profile, but we can also do the profile creation on our um, through our, our our website. Um, if they wanted to edit their information, what um, then I also have to make sure that they're coordinated with our WordPress website. Like, would they first need to be a subscriber then on our WordPress website before then they would be able to edit any information in Civi CRM? Um, so, okay, so this, this is rel relatively complex. I mean, I, I, I could probably dig out a slide, but I'll try and explain it. Um, so, um, users who are not logged into your site um, mm -hmm. cannot date their information uh, in, in several ways with Civi. So um, the first thing is that um, if, if you imagine that um, somebody was to uh, make a donation, let's say, for example, I'm not sure if this is uh -huh. you know, your use case, but let's just take that. So in a normal case, yeah. let's say, uh, uh, so like, let's say I come to the website, Jamie Novick, uh, and I, I want to make a donation. Um, I'll probably give an email mm -hmm. address. So I'll probably say Jamie Novick, that's jamie at compucore.co.uk, make a donation. If I come along a second time and want to make a second donation, um, mm -hmm. what what Civi tries to do is to ensure that the donation, the second donation, is attached to my contact record that was created from the first donation. So when the mm -hmm. first donation was made, it will create my contact record and then it will create a donation attached to my contact. When I come along the second time, it tries to do that. And the way that it does that is it uses the, the deduplication rules. So you see here under yep. find and merge duplicate contact, there's some rules here around duplicate. It's worth having a read about them. They're supervised, unsupervised, general, um, and they get into a fair, fair amount of detail there. Um, so it, in, in, this, in sort of the general instance, what happens is that, you know, Civi uh, avoids trying to make uh, duplicate contact. Um, so when mm -hmm. somebody comes along for the second time, if, for example, um, the, uh, let's say I changed my address, it would actually update my address um, because I, I'm the same contact I was before, i.e. my email address is the same, um, but my address is updated and therefore it will update my address and add those details along with the second contribution. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, the, the other thing that, in it, that you can use is that, um, so it, you know, if enough of the details are matching, it will update automatically. It knows to use these rules. Now the other thing is that you can use something called a checksum token, um, and this is this is also quite complicated. So um, you, you'll find some more details about this on the wiki. So check um, token, uh, and, and basically um, what it is is that if you if you see here if you send the link to somebody to an online form and include this mm -hmm. special little bit of code at the end of it and send it out mm -hmm. via Civi mail or from Civi's email. When they click on this link, it will automatically pre-fill the form with the details or with their details because we know which contact they were. Mm. Does that make sense? So if I was to receive an email yeah. which says, uh, you know, Jamie, why don't you click on this link to, uh, to update your details? If you've sent it out from Civi CRM, because Civi knows that my contact checksum is X and my contact ID is Y, um, it will pre-populate mm -hmm. that with the details you already hold for me. Um, and that's quite a nice way to not have to give people a login to the site, but allow them to kind of update their details and also to remove the barriers to um, event registration and membership sign-up or renewal. So you send them a, a checksum token link and then it fills it in. So, so that's kind of point yeah. number two or another method. Um, you, you might need to have a bit of a play with that with WordPress because uh, I remember that you know it, it, the link is slightly different for WordPress. Um, yep. Now, point number three is that the the last way of doing this is, like you said, to give somebody a login to the site. Um, in which mm -hmm. case, uh, it should be relatively simple. Um, you can enable the profile to have uh, account creation. So I think that was uh, mm -hmm. what we were just looking at that. So here in the profile, uh, we've got uh, add profile, and this is the form that somebody would fill in. And here you can say account creation, account creation required, for example, or give option, and that will then give them a uh, a user account or ask them for a password and a username, etc. And they can set that up. 
Um, now, uh, for the WordPress, you, you then probably want to give them a default role as well when you do that, etc. So there's a little bit more that you probably want to think about there. Um, okay. So in which case then, yes, they have a role and therefore will have access. And you can create then a post or a page which their role that you've just assigned them, would, they would have access to. And that would include within it uh, the profile that you had suggested. And if somebody's logged into the site, the profile will be pre-populated with their details. Mm, okay. Did, did, did you follow all of that? It's, it, there's quite a, sorry, a little bit that you kind of need to. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. Logical jump. For, for me, mm -hmm. for me, it sounds like um, the best way. Um, to me, that stands out is using that checksum token, and um, and then based on um the um the do uh, the the rules um as long as they have the same um name and email address it should automatically update all the rest of the information when they refill oh, out the with, form with the checksum you don't have to worry about that the checksum they can change their email address or anything that that's fine cuz the checksum means that we know exactly which contact id it is Oh great, great. So yeah. okay, so, so and it, yeah. and that would make so I I see the use then for like our volunteers, you know, on um, an annual or biannual kind of basis, just to make sure that because we also with our profile, um, especially for our volunteers, what times of day are best for them to to volunteer, uh, and yeah, that will change. Um, Based on their work schedules and class schedules and all of that, so using the checksum then can be just like a check-in and say, "Hey, has any of this changed? If so, use this link." Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, and then and go back out. Okay, that sounds so great. So that that checksum would have to be a link that you know comes out from the email that you send to them. So that's the answer. Correct. Two points. Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah, see, I, um, didn't, I didn't know about the text sound, so that's great. Yeah, good. There we go. Um, cool. Uh, cool. So um, then uh, in terms of like the dashboard here, um, you can see you've got the dashboard, and this will show reports um, that the administrator can create in Civi. So um, the thing to kind of explain in terms of the reports is that normally you'll have Two administrator, uh, sorry, two levels of uh, access to the report. You'll have kind of the administrator level, and then you'll have the user level. And what you probably have is the administrator level will have permissions in order to create new reports, and that will mean they'll have access to this report criteria element at the top here. So they're able to kind of create new reports, specify which fields are on them, the grouping, the order by, and how that data will come out. Um, and then they're able to kind of save that report in the report settings here and add it to the menu or allow it to be added to the dashboard. Um, now, that will be kind of the, the top level permission. And then what you'll probably have is another set of permissions for just users who they can add it to their dashboard or they can view the report uh, as it stands. So they wouldn't then necessarily be able to edit this report or change the headings in it or anything like that. So here in the dashboard, okay. you're able to add. Uh, you know, the reports and users are able to add those reports. So you can have a look at the permissions in order to set that kind of stuff up. Um, okay. So, yeah, so we have the dashboard. Uh, you have some quick links here. Uh, this might be slightly different on the WordPress platform, um, but these are kind of... Uh, it's it's very things. similar. Yeah, cool. Uh, okay, great. So that, that's, the, that's kind of the, the base of the screen. So if I, if I take you to a contact record, um, so the contact record, um, obviously, uh, the system tries to group all the information about a person in one particular place. And this is the contact record where you will find it all. Um, and the contact record, um, there's, there's various different, the, the first tab, or the, the information is split across various tabs. Uh, on the first tab, we have the basic summary and demographic information, communication information. Um, so uh, there's a few things. Let me uh, talk you through these um, so you can see it. Um, so uh, actually, I better uh, one thing that's been customized. Let me switch that off. So here we go. Um, 
So I'm going to skip over. You, you have the employer field, and I'll come back to that in a second when I talk about relationships, uh, job title, mm -hmm. nickname, source, uh, there's some base fields, uh, multiple email addresses, obviously, are standard, uh, multiple addresses, uh, uh, so people can have a home address, a billing address. Actually, when somebody makes a purchase online, uh, the if they specify a separate billing address, that will come in as billing address, so it all kind of filters through. Um, one thing about addresses, which is quite cool, and you can see it here, is that um, people can share addresses. So you can put it in and have, uh, I'm actually using another contact address. Um, and so if you share the address, that means that if you were to update the address of Beach Health Fellowship, uh, this person's address would obviously update at the same time. So that, that's quite a useful feature mm -hmm. there. So if you've got a family or something like that, it's good to kind of share addresses. Um, and then here you've got okay. the communication preferences. And there's some quite useful stuff in here. Um, and this all feeds through then into the, the mailing module if it's all set up correctly. So people are able to set privacy. So, you know, do not phone, do not email, do not mail. So if somebody phones mm -hmm. up and says, hey, don't, uh, don't email me, don't phone me, uh, then that'll, that'll work like that. Um, I believe um, if you kick the do not email here, it won't, it won't allow you to send them emails. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, and send email. Yeah, so there it's confirmed. So contact with do not email will be excluded from receiving civ mail mailing, so bulk mailings, and also you can't send them a personal email. However, they will still receive okay. a contribution receipt and event uh, registration confirmation. So there's a few things there just about that. Um, the no bulk mm -hmm. emails user opt out. Um, when you send a mailing to people, there's there's kind of two links that you can add to it. Uh, one is kind of opt out of all mailings, and another is unsubscribe from group. Um, yeah. And um, so if if somebody was part of a group that made up the mailing, then um, uh, yeah, then they'd be able to unsubscribe from that. If they opt out of the mailing, you'll see this ticked here, and as you can see, this person's opt out, and there's no bulk mailing. And actually, when you search, you, you'll see that they also have a red, uh, uh, a red arrow through them. Uh, and actually, you can't send them bulk mailings, obviously, as well. Um, so that's you know, all linked through so the, to the unsubscribe. Um, preferred methods, that's kind of more for internal. Preferred languages, so that can then drive what language they see in the CMS. Um, email format, so which ones will they receive. Uh, communication style, obviously, it's quite a new one, I think, for me. Uh, it might change the postal system. That's a new one, of course. Right? Um, and here's some quite mm -hmm. cool stuff as well, which is that you can change kind of the greeting that a person has as well. So you can make a customized kind of first name, last name, or dear doctor such and such here uh, under the greeting element. So if you, if you know this, yeah, I actually have. Name. Yeah, and I have a question about um, greetings. This kind of goes to the name as well too, because there's the nickname option. Um, yeah. And what I'm particularly interested in is, um, well, in, in having a preferred name for individuals who do have a preferred name. So for us, with um, particularly with the LGBT community, that that preferred name is often crucial. And um, the challenge that I've come across is if someone does, I do want to make sure we have the individual's legal name, um, and then, but that if there is, say, a nickname or a preferred name slot that it always, um, for all the mailings and all of the, um, the emails, that it automatically does those first. And I, for me, I haven't seen an option to do that other than if someone has a nickname, to then make sure that I go down to those email greeting and postal greeting and make sure I switch it to the nickname as opposed to the, to the, um, the actual first name. Do you, do you have suggestions for that? Yeah, so I mean, that, that make what you're doing at the moment is probably the, the easiest kind of lo-fi method. Um, what you can mm -hmm. do is you can write a little bit of smarty code in the email, uh, which would, if, you know, if this is blank, then show this. Uh, and you can actually put that into the email, uh, and you could then have the, you know, the the another custom field, for example, for the preferred name or something along those lines. Um, so there there is kind of a little development tweak around it, but it so it might be worth kind of posting up on the forum and just say, you know, I'm trying to do this. Uh, either can somebody help me with it, or you know, is anybody interested in spending a couple of hours to do it for me? Okay. All right. So that would require yeah. then. Um, Essentially, the creation of a new token would that be something? Kind of or uh, 
it uh, might not be a new token. It might be like a, a little bit of code that, uh, like a line of okay. code that kind of, you know, a few a little sentence that um, would, yeah, would hide one of them if the other one existed or something along those lines. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and then to take a look okay. at. Them. But in the meantime, yeah, using the greeting and changing the greeting is, you know, the easiest method around that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what you can see right. underneath here, I think you, you've come across this already, but this is some custom fields as well. So um, just to mm -hmm. explain it, uh, Civi uh, has this concept of custom fields. And, you know, why do we have those? Uh, it, it's so that you can extend the database uh, in order to store uh, additional fields around contact. And actually, custom fields you'll see are all around the entire system, so we can extend any of the entities um, to, to have some extra fields. So we can, I'll, I can show you some of that uh, in a moment. So that's especially relevant, for example, if somebody's purchasing a, uh, a ticket for an event, for example, you might want their dietary requirements or their breakout group options or something along those lines, in which case you'd want to have mm -hmm. some custom fields attaching to the participant there. Uh, so we can take a look at that mm -hmm. if we have a bit of time. Um, so this is a, an individual contact, and you can see that we have the different contact types. Um, so organizations would be slightly different uh, insofar as that um, they have slightly different uh, fields on the on the record as well. So if we went to say an organization, oh, no, on the organization record. So here on the organization, we can see that the fields are slightly different for them, um, and uh, they don't have a, a current employer, uh, and I'll come back to that uh, shortly. Um, so mm -hmm. you see here that we have these base, what to be like to call the base organization types, so individuals, household organizations. Uh, and then within mm -hmm. these, we're able to create subtypes uh, if, if we need. Um, so what's the reason for creating subtypes? Uh, I'll just show you where you do that. Like customize data and streams, and then you've got contact types here, and then you're able to add in a, a contact type and say it's based on individual organization, household, etc. Um, so, why do we do that? Um, we do that um, firstly for segmentation. So, if you want to search and bring back all the people of one particular type, then it's easy to do. Um, but then also um, because of um, it, it allows Civi allows you to attach different custom fields to different contact subtypes. So the general rule is that um, if you want to have uh, custom fields which attach to uh, certain contacts but not other types of contacts, then you need different contact subtypes in order to do that. Um, so if you want to say for staff you want to record uh, you know, what department they're in, uh, but you don't want that to be against, say, the parents, um, then we would uh, separate them out and have two different contact types. And then here, when we set up the custom field, we're able to specify uh, which type of individual. So here, I would say individual, and I might say it's for students, or sorry, or we were saying for uh, staff. Um, then the custom fields will only show for those particular contact types. Okay. Have you come across custom fields then? Yes, I have. Yep. I've um, I've been doing that for our volunteers. Once again, for them to be able to designate, um, you know, which which time of day they're available, um, and then also to kind of um, some questions, particular to our to our volunteers and the services that we provide and what their interests are and why. Um, I've done that. My, I do have a question. So, and I, because I've done some some reading then on the different contact types, um, mm -hmm. because so I had the joy of of when I first started doing this, um, that some information had been put in to the system. So, and that's still going to be a work in progress and going through and editing it all. Um, okay. And with households and individuals, and from what I was reading, and I want to kind of confirm this as well too, is um, actually just not to use the households, um, especially because um, then it can get challenging with mailings and things like that. Um, I didn't know what your recommendation was or, or what your experience has been with that um, for, for yeah. doing direct mailings and just throwing out the information. That's, 
that's kind of been generally accepted, which is that the households need a little bit more development in order to, you know, to keep up with kind of the way that the rest of civvies develop. Um, so I, I would generally suggest that there's, there's not very much that you can't do with sharing addresses and relationships uh, that you need kind of the household for. Mm -hmm. And it's best, it does solve a few problems in terms of uh, contact numbers and who am I mailing, etc. So that, that does make a little mm -hmm. sense. Okay, and then yeah. um, um, would you, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, no, go um, ahead. Uh, with the with the home address because you have it the uh, belongs to an organization here, um, would you be able to also link that to an in, another individual then? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So okay. you can set this here, and then if I say, uh, see if I can change that one. There we go. Save, and here we see we've got more than one address. And there we go. We now say that this person has linked to this address here. Okay. Fantastic. Cool. So, okay, so we've got the different uh, base contact types, and maybe we set up some subtypes with some custom fields attached to them. Uh, and now, like we mm -hmm. said, we want to join up these uh, these contacts uh, so that we're able to see kind of the linkages between them. And that's why we have the um, relationships uh, tab. So the relationships tab allows you to kind of specify that a person or a contact one is linked to contact two, and the way that 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 those two contacts are linked. Um, so there are some built-in relationship types uh, which are specific to kind of civvy, um, and those are uh, the employer-employee relationship, and actually there's some which are, are used for cases as well. Um, so the employer-employee relationship is a little bit special, which is that just so that you have kind of this current employer field. So if we wanted to change this and say Jamie moved to, uh, let's find a different organization maybe. Uh, I'm now employed by a big building. Um, and here if we refresh, you'll see that I'm an employee of a build building. Uh, and actually what Civi does automatically is it moves uh, my previous relationship into inactive relationships here uh, down below. So mm -hmm. relationships can be mm -hmm. current and they can be inactive. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, to allow for historical tracking. So that could be, you know, past employment. Uh, it could also be past relationships between people, so maybe you need to track, you know, uh, divorces, separations, whatever it may be, maybe that's important. Uh, it could also be, you know, previous uh, linkages between people in the organization as well. Um, so um, the, you can uh, set the relationship to be inactive, and then you can actually go in here and you could put in the specific date uh, that the, uh, the relationship started and ended if you knew that as well. And actually what you can do is that if you put the end date of the relationship in, um, you're able to, uh, and if you put that in the future, for example, because you know it's going to end on a particular date. Civi um, will automatically move that into the inactive relationships once that date passes as well, which is quite useful. Brilliant. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's a small point here, which is that around this uh, current employer tick, so only one of the uh, employer-employee relationships, because you could have multiple, people can be employed by multiple, only one of them can be shown on the front screen there, and ticking that box makes this one the one that's shown on that front screen. Okay. There's also a couple of other, there was also a couple of other features here, so the description, uh, this shows just underneath, so a... So this is kind of useful because uh, it kind of comes up. Okay. There you go, a little description there. Um, and oh, also, okay. um, there's some things around permissions here. So um, you can set up your permissions in such a way that only people with certain relationships is able to view the, and update the information based on you know that, that relationship existing. And when would that come into play? So that kind of goes back to my... The, the other question then, when an individual would be able to edit and kind of view that information, what what's an example in which that person then, if, a, if permitted to do so, because um, they would have to do some place on the website for them where they would have access to be able to do that? Yeah, so this is more for users of the system, actually. So um, wh what you find is every user of the system will, will be a Drupal or WordPress 
user and we'll have a login. Mm -hmm. uh, now, mm -hmm. that login will then be linked to a Civi CRM contact. Uh, so that mm -hmm. your admin user is linked to an admin contact and any other staff member will probably have a Civi contact. If you want to set up your mm -hmm. permissions in a certain way um, and that person has the, the Drupal or WordPress permission to access Civi, that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. If you then set up your Civi ACL groups in the right way, you can then only grant them access to contacts they have a relationship with. Yeah. Follow that. Okay. So there's a step. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that's the relationship. Yeah. So you can put in the contact, different contact types, have some custom fields, then we put in some relationships and join them all up. Uh, now you want to do something with those contacts, um, and generally you kind of want to sort of filter, segment. Um, that's where we come into kind of groups and tags. Um, so Civi has this concept of groups. Uh, you can create a group, uh, as you probably know, there's uh, some bulk actions for creating groups. Mm -hmm. I'll show you that in a second. Uh, Adding a group is relatively simple. You just add that person to the group, they're in the group, uh, and then you can remove them from the group, uh, and then it goes into their past groups. If people are part of a mailing um, and are, have the unsubscribe link, they can remove themselves from the group, and in which case the status will say removed, and then it will say by the username. And again, it records the date. And that's useful because you can see how many people unsubscribe themselves from particular groups and why. Uh, and you can then segment better and target better. Um, Civi also has this concept called smart groups. Um, and smart groups are, are basically a saved search. Um, so the way to do that is that you, you do a search here. Um, I'm going to create another one. Uh, and let's say that it's all the people who, uh, hopefully I'll get some results from this. Uh, let's say they're all the people who, made a payment to us in the past year. Or this year. Hopefully I'll get some results. So here we go, I've got five results for that. Now, as you can probably expect, that group uh, will change as the year goes on because new people will donate. So the idea behind a smart group is the fact that you provide it with this criteria. Um, and then set an eye group, mailing group. Um, and um, you provide the criteria and it keeps itself up to date. So if another person comes along and makes a donation, uh, let's see if I can. Or Barclay. Contribution. Equals contribution. Uh, donation. 100 pounds. I'm just going to do a little cheat here because you need to uh, clear the caches because it's actually cached to the page. So you just have to wait for it all to update. Mm. My risk strategy demonstrates it. Uh, and then if we go to this group and we go to people who donated this year and do a search, our man Bob Barkley has now been added to that list, you can see. Um, so this is kind of yep. then allows you to cut set up your segments and your groups uh, without having to worry too much about constantly adding or removing people from it. Um, people can still now, unsubscribe from these groups. Mm -hmm. um, so with that smart group, does, does that keep the original, like if you designated within the last year um, and say you check back in that in two months, is that then a year from that day in two months that you checked from it or does it go back to the original start Dates that you had made two months prior. Does that, does that make sense? Civi has um, these various relative dates in. So on the advanced search, you'll find um, this drop down, which is kind of like a built in drop down of various relative dates. Mm -hmm. So you can either mm -hmm. specify the date range and say from X to Y, or if you mm -hmm. want to say this year, this year, this quarter, or a previous year, <laughs> prior to previous year, etc. So you can specify. Of various amounts of relative dates, and actually, um, if you want, um, you can get a little developer to to add to this list as well. And I think 4.6 allows you to specify ones in the future as well. Okay. Or will now you specify ones in the future? Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> cool. Thank you. Cool. So um, 
So that's a, so you can create groups and smart groups, and groups can have a hierarchy as well. So you can have groups within groups. Uh, so if a group is a uh, a parent group, uh, so if I add a group, this group, uh, so another group. Uh, I'll come to these in a second. Um, you can specify which is the parent group. And then obviously any people who are in the subgroup will automatically be in the parent group when you when you then search for that parent group. Um, mm -hmm. As mentioned here, we've got group types. Um, so groups can be used for two main things in Civi, access control and the other thing is for mailing lists. Um, so if you want a group to come up on the mailing, so when you do new mailing, you have to tick it here as mailing mm -hmm. list. So if you don't see that group uh, in this list here, then you haven't ticked that box basically is the answer. Um, the other thing mm -hmm. is that you can be used for access control. Um, and this is a little bit advanced, so I'll, I'll probably skip over this. But if you're trying to set up who can see what in your system, as we touched on before, you can do some clever stuff right. with groups uh, here through the manage ACL. So you could say this group of people is able to see this other group of people in your system. Mm -hmm. The next thing is visibility. Mm -hmm. So there are certain screens in Civi, for example, the uh, contact dashboard, where people are able to edit their groups. Uh, so if I go mm -hmm. edit the group that I'm in, so um, obviously you might not want all of your groups to be shown there. So the visibility mm -hmm. will uh, change which one of the, or whether or not the group is shown in this drop down list basically, and, and elsewhere on, on public forms. Okay, I have a few questions about that. Um, um, yeah, um, so the, what are different options for visibility? Oh, sorry, there was. Uh, I'll go back here. Uh, hold on. Uh, I've got. Uh, Are there only two options? Yeah, Either. it's only public or user and user admin. Um, is, is there a way, like say on one page, you only want to have a certain number of groups um, visible, but on a different page on your website, you want different groups visible? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think what you can do is that you can add um, the group to a profile. So here, if, if say, okay. for example, somebody was going to fill out a, a pro oh, not custom field, sorry. Um, I think I know what you're trying to do, which is you're trying to say some group, some people should only be able to subscribe to certain groups and others should only be able to subscribe to other groups. Is that right? Yeah, that or, you know, yeah, exactly, or based on their different interests. So if they're, say, on the um, HIV page and they want to sign up for groups related to HIV stuff, then that's there. Or um, for our other example, for our syringe access program, if they're interested in and signing up for groups related to that than only viewing those groups and signing up for those. So, yeah. They, actually, you can see here, this answers that question. Your site is currently configured to require double opt-in when users join to groups via profile form. That's interesting. I'm, I'm, I'll have to look up where the setting is for that for you. That answers your earlier question. I thought I had seen it somewhere. Okay. Um, in this mode before you need to, yeah, it's not before you can have the group. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I have to confirm whether or not you can have separate ones uh, for different people. I think that the solution okay. to that instead might be to um, to maybe use separate custom fields and then to create smart groups based on those custom fields, if you understand my okay. meaning. Um, I can give it a try. People can update their preferences. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, so so that's kind of the core of it with 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 groups um, and then tags. Um, what I would say with tags is that there's not very much you can do with tags necessarily um, that you couldn't do with custom fields. Um, but tags mm -hmm. are kind of like another way of uh, giving like a, an extra attribute to a contact. So and they're very quick. You just uh, tag, uh, you know, tick the box. Um, there is also another type of tag which is kind of a free format tag. Uh, I'll show you that quickly. So if I add a tag, uh, I have to remind myself. Oh, hang on. This tag set.
Oh, and um, I'm noticing the time. I'll probably have about five more minutes. So I don't know yeah. if quickly it's gone. <laughs> so here with the tag set, you can see that you can very quickly, uh, you know, dog, uh, new tag, tap. So that, that's kind of the more useful use of tags, which you can kind of add those there. And then if you want to do a mm -hmm. search for somebody, um, you can base on the kind of tags you're given. I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest, um, you know, kind of, uh, using that too often because you you end up with quite unstructured data basically that's not ideal. Okay. Um, yeah, that's um that's good to know. I yeah, I've seen the tags and and then I was reading the difference between groups and tags and I kind of had gravitated towards not really using tags for anything crucial. It's just kind of more I view it as more like a temporary um, designation um, and then. If it's something that's yeah. more permanent, I'd probably develop that into a group. Yeah, or a custom field at least, where you know that that's where. Oh, yeah, or a custom field. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So, so that's that stuff. Um. I I guess I mean, is there anything specific you'd like to spend the last couple of minutes on, or? Um. No, this was very helpful. So I definitely learned some new things. So I appreciate that. Um. I I have a feeling that. For my for my experience trying it out and and playing along with it at this point, I may have moved past the the initial beginning stages. Um, so I guess kind of where to get more help from Civi CRM. I know that they have a list of organizations as well too that can reach out and provide services. Um, we don't have the reason why. Um, so I was hired on as a one person development team. Um, a year ago, and you know, mm -hmm. part of that is establishing a, a CRM, and then Civi CRM was chosen because we don't have a budget for it. Um, so similarly, we don't have really a budget for um, receiving additional systems. But I'm really feeling like that's in order to really implement this, I'm going to need more help. Um, what your recommendations are for that, and that's why for me it was kind of testing out. Um, this this training to see what information was provided and really thank you for your help and um, today too. But what kind of suggestions you may have for further assistance down down the road? So uh, yeah, the, the first thing I would say is that, and this this kind of stands for CRMs in general, which is that it's it's a bit dangerous if you know the organization's value on its data is that we don't have the money to spend any money on our on our data mm -hmm. um, and still mm -hmm. expected to kind of be successfully getting value out of it because, um, you know, implementing a CRM costs money um, and Civi will help reduce that cost, um, but it shouldn't be viewed as a CRM can be implemented for free uh, successfully. I, you know, there's just too many examples of uh, poor implementations because of that. Um, so yep. I, I would strongly suggest that you kind of go back to them and kind of explain that point, you know, which is that, you know, if, if our data is important and uh, if we're going to use this, then, you know, we, we do need to invest in it. Um, that, okay. that actually will be more cost effective uh, than a lot of other solutions out there. Um, now, so that's yep. point number one. Now, um, the things to, to kind of check out then that, you know, you can take a look at. Um, so firstly, there's the, the main website. Um, so there's events, there's news on there. Uh, case studies, partner listings, and webinars like this one, so uh, that you can kind of check out so if you can pick anything else out. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. expecting that you've probably seen the book, um, so there is kind of a user and administrator guide. So um, let's just see if I can find it mm -hmm. um, here. Yeah. Um, there's also quite a useful um, Civi CRM cookbook, uh, which is. Uh, oh. which was written by uh, an English guy actually called Tony Horrocks. Uh, and that's quite mm -hmm. good as well. It, it's a little bit uh, down towards the, the Drupal end of things, so there's a bit more that you can do kind of on the Drupal side, but it's quite useful right. for uh, doing some kind of more technical stuff and how to, how to get about those kind of things that come up and how to solve them. Uh, so that's quite handy. Um, mm -hmm. there, obviously, there's a good piece. So, uh, you know, kind of diving in there, there's lots of useful information. Again, it's about kind of how much time you can spend, um, you know, looking at that. But there's loads of information here uh, about kind of all, all different configurations. Um, as you probably know, getting on the forum, uh, that's another good place uh, if you're trying to find out some extra information. Just ask 
Um, the guys are really good at kind of getting back to you. Compared to any other forum I know on the planet, it's it's one of the fastest that you'll get a response to anything on. Um, the other okay. one is IRC. I don't know if you've ever popped on IRC before. Uh, I don't use it that much myself, actually, but uh, hashtag CBCRM. Uh, and then, again, generally you can get hold of somebody if you need to have a, a conversation with them or a team or otherwise there's not many people around. Um, and then, uh, generally, um, they're... One of the best things actually would be to get involved with one of the sprints. So the uh, the sprints are normally after the conferences. So CiviCon Denver is coming up very soon. Uh, yeah. And it's I would I would certainly recommend uh, getting across uh, to that. Uh, and there's actually then a, a sprint afterwards. So if you can get the time off, um, then that's a great way uh, to get basically some free training because you'll be embedded, you know, in the team. Uh, you'll be asked, you know, you can get involved even as a non-developer doing some testing or writing some documentation and things. Um, so that would be, mm -hmm. you know, that's probably a really good idea as well. Um, and uh, the meetup. So I mean, we run a, a, a bi-monthly meetup here in London. Uh, so there might be a similar one near you as well. Um, and mm -hmm. then the other thing to check out is the extension directory because there's always useful stuff there. So you know, if you've got an issue, chances are somebody else might have solved it uh, already as well. Yep. Cool. All right. Cool. Uh, so that that's is fantastic. Kind of a, yeah, great. Okay. Uh, right. I'll, I'll let you get off there. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, some personalized. No, thank you. Time. I really appreciate it. I know this was very, very helpful for me. So I really appreciate you taking the time and um, and offering this this service too. So. No worries. That's right. Cool. All right. Take care, Brian. Speak to you soon. You too, Jamie.